Greetings to everyone. So, today we will be discussing about the uh, and we will continue discussing about the gaseous nitriding. So, in the last lecture we have uh, come to the understanding that why it is possible to perform gaseous nitriding using ammonia hydrogen mixture rather than with pure N2. And then we have also come to the is a, a situation where actually the schematic microstructure like a, how actually the microstructure evolves as the nitriding process continues. So, in this slide what is shown is the schematic microstructure. So, we discussed about its features in the last class. So, to cover quickly, so we have a outer layer that is called the compound layer. So, R often it is called as white layer because when you do the uh, metallographic preparation of the nitrided specimen cross sections and when you etch it with nitol and you take it into the light microscope all these iron nitrides appear white because they actually does not get etched and they just simply reflect back all the light. So, that is why it is also uh, known as a white layer in the especially in uh, people in industry. So, and then other layer which is the diffusion zone right we discussed about that also. So, where actually and what kind of properties can be obtainable from that and then we said that if we have a commercial steel as you see that here the commercial steel will have several elements inside right. These are all have been added to give a bulk property which is essential for the component. So, now when we doing a nitriding for a commercial steel this is uh, becomes a very complicated situation because the nitrogen is diffusing inwardly into the sample and we, we have to understand how this nitrogen actually interacts with all the elements in the solid individually or collectively and that is what actually leads to the overall nitriding response. So, in this context today we will see that at least we try to understand what happens in nitriding of a relatively simple alloys. So, the most simplest would be the pure iron. So, in this uh, lecture we will look at what actually happens when we nitride the pure iron and then we go on to uh, understand actually the other uh, alloys such as when we add a aluminum into the iron or silicon or you know that we can also club the elements. And like this we can build on to the chemistry of commercial steel. So, this kind of understanding helps in optimizing the chemistry of the steel as well as the nitriding parameters that is the temperature and nitriding potential R n right in the outer atmosphere. So, now when we look at nitriding of pure iron, so then the diagram this uh, iron nitrogen phase diagram ok, this we have discussed already why it is called metastable and this will be of more uh, direct relevance because as you see that in this diagram is only valid for iron and nitrogen alloys right the whereas uh, actual commercial steels we cannot use this kind of a diagram. And now we have also seen this Leherer diagram ok. This is also actually only for this is done for when we try to nitride pure iron that is why these two diagrams can give direct comparison of the obtained results for nitriding of pure iron and then we can understand the thermodynamics of nitriding of pure iron utilizing these diagrams. So, we have understood that in the last lecture if you apply the nitriding conditions within this alpha field of the Leherer diagram that means, we are sticking to this region of BCC iron ok a very small window and then we have this other region of gamma prime where we can produce the uh, gamma prime iron nitride on the sample surface. Now, we try to understand actually what happens when we are nitriding with the nitriding conditions that means, for example, at 550 degree Celsius 
let us say with a nitriding potential R n of 0.1 that means, we are using this situation as for the nitriding this point. Okay. Now, we know that from this thermodynamically it will not be able to form iron nitrides the immediate nitride which we expect is the gamma prime iron nitride that is this compound in this iron nitrogen phase diagram. Okay. So, now when we do that what happens actually is for example, we have a uh, uh, sample and then the nitriding atmosphere supplies the nitrogen into it that means, we provide the nitrogen into it and then it starts to dissolve and initially if you look at actually how the concentration is changing. So, if I am plotting here the concentration how it will be changing then it will be something like that and then if you keep it for enough time. So, slowly this will be saturating and then you end up with a saturation level of nitrogen content. So, now this nitrogen content once it reaches that throughout the sample that means, throughout the thickness of the sample then we know that the sample has received. So, what I am showing here with this curves is the nitrogen content as a function of depth below the surface. So, this is this axis I am plotting percentage of nitrogen and this is the depth below the surface and this is what we expect that this will get saturated. This is the first uh, you know the when we do the nitriding of pure iron that is what it happens here. Now, at the same temperature of 550 degree Celsius by changing the nitriding potential to different values as you can see that you can change it from 0.01 or 0.02 then what exactly we can change is the amount of nitrogen that is this level that is the equilibrium saturation level of nitrogen which a BCC iron can take up at this temperature we can vary systematically. That means, we see that there is a maximum solubility of nitrogen in the BCC iron is here it is given as 0.4 atomic percent. Now, if I want to produce a uh, BCC iron with 0.2 atomic percent nitrogen that is possible by appropriately choosing the nitriding potential at the given temperature. So, this is the uh, very nice feature of gaseous nitriding we can thoroughly control the uh, thermodynamics of the process that means, we can produce all the phases of the iron nitrogen phase diagram as pure phases by starting from the uh, pure iron. Now, let us move to if we use the nitriding conditions which allow the formation of let us say the iron nitrides that means, now for example, I take the nitriding potential let us say that is let us say 3 uh, 2 right this is the nitriding potential of 2 at the same temperature. Now, you know that you will be able to form epsilon iron nitride that is at the surface gamma prime immediately below that followed by the diffusion zone right this is where you have a dissolved nitrogen content. So, now actually how such a process runs. Okay. So, that is what we will see initially we know that as the nitrogen enters into the solid it gets dissolved right as we look at as a function of time initially nitrogen dissolves into alpha iron that is BCC iron and once at the given temperature we surpass the solubility limit of the ferrite matrix ok. That means, this uh, that you can read from the phase diagram what is the solubility limit of the ferrite matrix at a given temperature and then actually you start to form the iron nitride nucleation at the surface. This is what is shown here schematically this is the sample surface ok and you have placed the nitriding atmosphere here that is supplying nitrogen and this nitrogen dissolves into the BCC iron and after some time it surpasses the solubility limit and the nucleation of this iron nitrides starts here. Okay. So, when this iron nitride nucleation happens as you know the isolated uh, places on the surface you see that there will be a some surface relief 
at the location that comes because of the volume misfit between the iron nitride and BCC iron. For example, if you have a Fe4N nitride and a, if you are producing it from pure iron there is a volume increase of about 20 percent. So, that is what actually leads to this kind of a situation. Now, the applied nitriding potential is high enough to allow also the epsilon iron nitride then it starts to nucleate on top of the this is the gamma prime nuclei as it is shown on top of that you start to produce the epsilon iron nitride nuclei. So, that is how actually you can see that this can uh, starts and what is shown here this one which you see as a you know the uh, related to a red colored matrix with green colored features this is a EBSD face map. Like light microscopy we use to distinguish the uh, different phases one can use electron backscatter diffraction ok. I will not go into the details of this technique, but by which we can also identify the phases based on their crystal structure. So, that is how one can actually discern that this is the uh, IR, uh, Fe4 gamma prime Fe4 n phase and this red color is meant for the iron matrix like this is the schematic and this is what is the real microstructure. So, now if you prolong the nitriding right you have started the nucleation sites and then when we prolong the nitriding then slowly you form a closed layer of gamma prime right as one can see here and then on top of that you form a closed layer of epsilon iron nitride ok and below that you have a diffusion zone that is nothing but BCC iron matrix with dissolved nitrogen whenever n is shown with this square bracket and with the you know the phase of alpha or you know whatever the phase that means this is a about a dissolved nitrogen in that solid phase. So, <coughs> this is the schematic what is shown on the top and the actual microstructure is shown below for a particular conditions of nitriding. So, as uh, one can see that you have a top surface having a epsilon iron nitride and below that gamma prime iron nitride. What you see these are the grain boundaries you know these lines of the this compound layer like this is the grain boundaries in the epsilon iron nitride layer these are shown schematically here with these lines ok. And then the way this uh, layers grow is they try to grow like a columns ok and then keeping their grain boundaries more or less perpendicular to the sample surface ok. This is the sample surface and you see that grain boundaries are running more or less perpendicular to the sample surface that is because the nucleation happens and they try to grow inwardly and with laterally bringing actually the uh, uh, grain boundary which is more or less normal to the sample surface. You see here this sample has been nitrided for 5 hours at 550 degree Celsius using this nitriding potential 2.37. So, if you look into the Leherer diagram 2.37 means we are somewhere here that is why we are forming epsilon, gamma prime and alpha as schematically shown here that is what exactly we are seeing in the microstructure. So, now we have discussed in earlier lectures that the di phase diagram what we see for iron nitrogen with indication of all the iron nitrides that is a gamma prime and epsilon is a metastable phase diagram that we have seen why we call it as a metastable phase diagram because it has always a tendency to produce N2 gas ok by dissociating these iron nitrides and then actually you will not end up with any iron nitrides we will end up with only a BCC iron with a small amount of nitrogen solubility as shown here. So, this is a phase diagram when we allow the equilibrium to be established the ultimate equilibrium that is formation of N2 gas. Whereas, here in this diagram ok we are not allowing the uh, equilibrium to be established that means, we are not allowing the N2 gas formation and then we end up with this kind of iron nitrides. So, this was for the pressure of one atmosphere that means, we are imposing a N2 gas of 
one atmosphere and then what phases we get. So, as we know that any metastable phases have a tendency to go to the equilibrium phases, right? but it is a matter of time right? that we agree. That is what exactly happens with these nitrides. If we prolong the nitriding time, that means we have uh, continued to nitride the sample, like if you take a relatively thick sample of uh, iron, let us say about 5 millimeter thick sample and if you are keep on nitriding, these iron nitride starts to grow from the surface and they start to thicken. And now, as you continue the oldest uh, the, the, the iron nitrides, because they are also at a temperature of nitriding, so they can exercise all kinetic mechanisms to go to the more equilibrium state. That means, they want to precipitate out N2 gas molecules. So, this is what exactly happens you see that here what is shown earlier the, the microstructure is that without any pores like in this first let us focus on this schematic in the top. So, what is shown now here is that you have a thicker layer of this epsilon and gamma prime and you start to see that along the grain boundaries of this gamma uh, epsilon iron nitride you start to see this uh, formation of N2 gas filled pores. Okay. That means, the nitrogen atoms go there and form a N2 molecule and this N2 molecule so as a gas phase starts to build up a pressure and that leads to such a situation as shown schematically here. Right? Recombination of nitrogen atoms leading to the formation of N2 and you see that this process also has a barrier for nucleation. For example, if the N2 gas has to form within the grain of iron nitride then it is not easy because it involves a more it requires a more driving force. Okay. So, for that you can see from the basic thermodynamics what actually the driving force means. So, I will not go into the details of that now, but you know that it is easy sites of this precipitation for N2 gas is the grain boundaries and also you see that at the surface then later they also starts to become nitride. So, this is a schematic microstructure what you see below here, okay. this is the real microstructure okay, after prolonged nitriding. So, in the previous slide what we have seen the microstructure after 5 hours of nitriding, now you see that this is for after 20 hours of nitriding under identical conditions. So, you start to see that now all these pores like what you see as this you know the uh, open grain boundaries I could call it. So, these are all actually the porous regions within the iron nitride layer. So, now when it comes to the practical applications whether these porous layers are you know the beneficial or not that they are usually detrimental for the mechanical property uh, point of view. First of all these iron nitride layers are very hard that means they are also brittle they have a very good wear resistance, but with the porosity they easily starts to break away when in the any of the impact loads. So, but only some applications where this porous porosity in the iron nitride layers will be like if you want to have a self lubrication situation. For example, if you have a moving part which requires a lubrication if you have a porous layer of this kind of iron nitrides the lubricating oil can go into the pores and then starts to wet the walls while it is coming down and then this can do continuously. So, that kind of you know the very uh, uh, selected applications where this porosity can be even engineered. Okay, now, this is all about nitriding of pure iron with nitriding conditions such that we allow the formation of iron nitrides and that what how the process runs. Okay. So, now if we look at that actual steels will contain now other alloying elements added into this. Right. So, now we will look at that aspect we do not have now pure iron we are looking at nitriding of binary F E M E alloys. Okay. This M E means 
other alloying element which can be you know the chromium or aluminum and uh, all other alloying elements. Now, how this kind of alloys okay, will behave during nitriding because of the presence of this additional element, what will happen to the growth of the this iron nitride layers. Okay. So, in this uh, context we are only focusing at the iron nitrides which are actually wants to grow on the surface of iron. That means, if you have a pure iron and let us say you have a Fe Me alloy and when we start to do nitriding of this both of them you know that in this case because of the Me here we know that the way the iron nitrides can grow as you know the epsilon and gamma prime layers right that is what we have seen. And now actually because of this element Me what happens to the growth of the uh, what, what way this Me influences the growth of the iron nitride layers in this kind of situation. So, for that actually before we go further now can we distinguish different types of Me elements in the context of nitriding of FeMe alloys. Okay. So, that means can we give some way the classification we have several elements which you can put. So, how we can actually see that already we can distinguish them as you know the uh, different kind of uh, nitrides. So, then in that context we want to have a demarcation as easy nitride formers and difficult nitride formers. Okay. That means elements which has Me which can easily form their own nitrides. Okay. That means, suppose if I have Me then how easily it can form Me and nitrides for example. Yeah. So, it is not always 1 is to 1 stoichiometry as you see that silica nitride and germanium nitride they have a different stoichiometry. And then you have can group other kind of nit uh, elements which are difficult nitride formers that implies they do form their own nitrides like Me and but their formation is relatively difficult. Okay, so, now to what kind of characteristics we can consider without having any experimental knowledge about these things. So, one is that how easily a Me and nitride forms that depends on we can look at from the if I have a Me metal if I make it to react with the nitrogen gas okay, then this is a solid then it forms Me and suppose. Yeah. Now, what is the Gibbs energy change associated with that reaction? The more the Gibbs energy the largely the negative the if for, for the considered nitrides we are saying that uh, difficult nitride formers and easy nitride formers that means they all tend to form nitrides these negative, but the more the negative that means they have a more tendency or a stronger uh, affinity to nitrogen that means they can be treated as easy nitride formers. But now what we are seeing in this reaction is about if I have a Me metal okay, and then if I put that Me metal reacting with a molecular N2 gas of one atmospheric pressure how it can form the nitride. But the situation which we are considering is Me is not present as a you know the uh, metal, but it is present as an element which is dissolved in iron matrix right. We have it is not that we have a pure Me, but we have a Fe Me alloy. Now, Me is present in a iron matrix right. We are considering only the solutions between iron and nitrogen that means, we are considering the chemistry of FeMe alloys within which Me can dissolve into the iron lattice. Now, in this situations of like you know the when the Me is present in a solid now in this if the Me wants to precipitate upon reaction then this is have to form as a particle of Me n in BCC iron matrix. Now, because something has to develop in a constrained matrix that means, why constrained is you have a 
surrounding solid in which you need to create a space to form this nitride. So, this leads to a certain difficulty for nitride formation. So, now these two parameters the more the larger the negative the value that is easy to form. Now, here the difficulty depends on what kind of volume misfit happens, what kind of volume change occurs when M e precipitates as M e n in B c c iron. So, that means, we are looking at if this volume misfit is very small then it does not have to do any elastic work to create a space for its development. So, now these two parameters ok, one is the Gibbs energy of formation of the nitride, another factor is the volume misfit between for the like this how one can see is that it is actually the what is the percentage of volume change which happens when F e M e alloy converts to F e and M e n kind of a two phase mixture ok. That is what these two parameters that is the volume misfit and the Gibbs energy change are shown here in this table right. This is the standard Gibbs energy change and this is the volume misfit which happens when these nitrides develop in BCC ferrite matrix and you see here the different several nitride forming elements are considered like a germanium, silicon, aluminum, titanium, vanadium and chromium and also at the end you see also the iron nitride. Now, first of all if you look at the iron nitride delta G of formation is positive right that is because that already tells that if you put the iron F e in this M e place you can never produce the iron nitride that is why we call it as a metastable yeah. and but for all other nitrides here you see that delta G is negative ok. You see that it is only for a comparison these values have been computed at 298 Kelvin, but in principle they should be taken for the actual nitriding temperatures. And this is the volume misfit at room temperature what is the amount of volume misfit you see that there is a distinctly you know the varying volume misfit although the gamma prime iron nitride has a less volume misfit, but it has a very small or a positive values of Gibbs energy. But here you have this kind of nitrides which have a cubic crystal system for their you know the crystal lattice and these are titanium nitride, vanadium nitride and chromium nitride. They have a relatively lower misfit and also the decent amount of Gibbs formation energy of these nitrides. And you have other group of nitrides this is a hexagonal crystal system they have a moderate values of negative values of standard uh, Gibbs energy of formation, but have a rather large volume misfit ok. So, now you see here aluminum nitride is shown in both cubic and hexagonal modification because it is observed that in during nitriding aluminum also tries to precipitate in a cubic crystal system structure with uh, <coughs> sodium chloride type structure. So, that is why the value for this nitride is not given here because it is metastable that will be a positive number, but in the given situations what are these values that is not known. So, now with this two kind of nitrides ok, now the highest the smaller the value of volume is fit and larger the value of negative value of the Gibbs energy makes that particular element as easy nitride former ok. So, now whether these are the two only two uh, factors there are other factors also which we should in principle consider. For example, when we form a new phase of iron uh, uh, nitride you are creating a new interface right. Initially it is all one homogeneous alloy now you are creating this interface. So, this energy of this interface ok. also plays a role in deciding whether particular element is easy nitride former or difficult nitride former. So, I will not go into the details of this, but consideration of the interfacial energy also favors that these nitrides that as titanium, vanadium and chromium nitrides are known to form easily ok, even in the context of interfacial 
energy consideration. So, now let us see how this two class of uh, materials actually uh, behave while you try to do the nitriding. So, so, this I will continue in the next class. So, to summarize what we have discussed in this lecture is we have tried to understand how actually the nitriding of a pure iron happens as a function of time for the given conditions of temperature and the nitriding potential. So, we have seen that these nitrides grow and due to their metastable nature they try to also dissociate leading to the formation of N2 gas, but because it requires certain time for these processes to run and this kind of N2 gas porosity development happens when you do nitriding for prolonged times. And then we have seen that now when we want to understand if the it is not pure iron it has got some other element dissolved in it. Okay. So, why I say it very specifically we are considering the alloys in which other element is in a dissolved state that means, we are we are considering only the solution phases that means, it is still a BCC uh, iron lattice with a dissolved other element. Then how actually this kind of alloys will respond to nitriding in particular to the development of iron nitrides. So, for that we have first seen that if we can understand how alloying elements can be grouped in the context of nitriding response when they are present in the iron lattice then we have seen them as we can group them as a easy nitride formers and difficult nitride formers. That means, we are considering the elements which are which forms nitrides because they have a uh, negative values of Gibbs energies of formation, but they have a, a either a slow or a faster way of development depending on their uh, barriers for precipitation such as volume misfit which they have with the ferrite matrix. So, and we accordingly we have classified these elements. Now, in the next class we will look at actually the actual behavior of these alloys when we have this kind of elements in the system. Thank you.